People who have surprisingly woken mm -hmm. up admitted into a hospital? What happened? <gasps> After a rugby game, I climbed into the back of a friend's pickup truck, fell asleep, and woke up in the ICU with no feeling from my waist down. We had been in an accident with an intoxicated driver. After a year and several surgeries, I walked out of the hospital an inch shorter and with enough metal inside me to trigger metal detectors at airports. I was the lucky one. The other three guys in the truck never woke up afterwards. 20 years and it still gets to me. The accident occurred in Zimbabwe, where I spent my childhood. Since then, I've traveled a lot but now consider myself a Kiwi living in New Zealand. It took some time before I learned about the fate of the others. Besides being heavily medicated, I don't think I was able to fully grasp what had happened. Visitors were limited in the ICU to my family. But the day after I was moved out, many of my rugby teammates and some staff came to tell me the grim truth. The small ward was packed with big, strong, and emotional men, and I loved each one of them for their support. Not sure where I was going with this, but I've ended up here. But here's a piece of advice from an older man who has lived with survivor's guilt for two decades, and who knows all too well the devastation left behind when someone is suddenly and tragically taken from their loved ones. If you're not completely in control, don't start the car. Don't put yourself in danger and don't risk ruining someone else's life. Take a cab, use public transportation, walk, but please, just don't drive. And intoxicated drivers are probably my number one pet peeve in the world. I don't care who you think you are, if you're not fit to drive, just don't grab the wheels, please. Story 2 It was 1982, woke up in a hospital bed, feeling fine, no idea what happened, nobody else in the room. Last person I remember hanging out with was my friend Scott, so I called his house. His mom answered, advised me to call my parents, no answer on the home phone. So I'm sitting in this bed, trying to figure out why I'm even there. I finally discover that the rolling table over the bed opens up and there's a mirror under the lid. Across my forehead and down the whole right side of my face, I saw it. Oh, that's why. I finally got hold of Scott and learned the story, which I still don't remember. Apparently, I was riding my bike down a sidewalk near the grade school. Sidewalk takes a 45 degree left turn and I cut the corner. Grass is deep and a little wet, and my front wheel catches on the edge of the sidewalk, flipping me over. Another neighborhood kid was in the area, hustled back to alert my parents. My dad took me to the hospital in his car, and I woke up the next day. Yes, my parents just left me in the hospital all by myself. And that is why we should always wear a helmet. Story 3 I woke up in the hospital, too weak to even process a medication pump, and was told I had been in a terrible motorcycle accident. I had been in a medically induced coma for five weeks and had lost all memory of the accident and the week before it. I was involved with some reckless individuals who were on parole and decided to rob a 7-Eleven store and led the police on a high-speed chase for 30 minutes. Their chase ended when they went the wrong way on the freeway and collided with me. The police recorded their confused statements after apprehending them, with them asking, what are you arresting me for? They received sentences of 9 and 5 years in a plea deal and I was notified when they were released after serving less than half of their sentences. They were completely sober, knew they had involved me, and left me. Despite being a generally compassionate person, I hope their lives are difficult and that they serve a long time, never getting the chance to hurt someone again. For my own mental health, I'll never try to find out what has become of them. This happened over 10 years ago, and I have a good life now with a loving girlfriend, a mortgage, a very smart border collie, and everything else I ever wanted, although it's been a significant struggle. I didn't receive any money except for $50,000 from the VVC fund and, surprisingly, their auto insurance. My medical bills were over $3 million, but I was insured, thankfully, as I had just started a new job six months prior. I used that money and my time in the hospital and recovery to get my MBA and have worked extremely hard to advance in my new career, which I had to change because I'm not very agile anymore. I'm still severely injured, I'll never run again, have any real balance, and need a cane. But I'm lucky because I still have my mental faculties and look relatively normal. I don't own a motorcycle anymore and will never ride one again. You need 100% of your physical and mental abilities to ride safely. I don't blame my motorcycle at all. If you ride and are reading this, just please make sure you buy the best safety gear and wear it every time. I'm only here today because I did and no amount of skill would have saved me from being in the exact wrong place at the exact wrong time. I was wearing a Nolan flip face helmet which cost $300 at the time, so thank you Nolan for your excellent quality and commitment to safety.
I still have that helmet, and it's damaged all the way through. Story 4. My wife, my son, and myself went to visit a couple of friends out in the country. Had some food, had a couple of drinks myself, had an amazing time. Wife was sober, I was wrangling my young one back into his car seat to go home because he was overtired and unhappy but made sure he was good and snug. Pulled out of the driveway after waving goodbye to our friends. I came almost a month and a half later. I could barely move my legs and arms due to fatigue. I had a feeding tube and a colostomy bag. The doctors told me that I had actually come a couple of days before while I was still in intensive care. But the nature of the anesthetic they had me on meant I kept kind of waking up, fading back, and forgetting everything. At this point, I was able to remember things normally. They told me right off the bat that my son was fine, completely unharmed and in the care of a very old and dear friend with three kids of his own already. My wife was alive and relatively uninjured with the exception of some damage that she would recover from slowly. They kept the details about the accident from me for a few weeks while I was still recovering. But basically, my wife missed a stop sign in the middle of a dark, poorly marked country road, and we had an accident with an SUV. Other driver was fine. It's been over two years since the accident. I got the strength back to walk again, but because of the appliances of my left ankle and shin, I'll never be able to run again. The fatigue in my legs wore off and eventually wore off in my arms to the point where I can use them normally again, but it was a lot of therapy, retraining, and time. Suffered mental challenges about 10 months after by the time I was back at home. From time to time, I still have nightmares about something that I don't technically have the ability to remember. Story 5. This was back in 2012. I was a bartender at the time. I removed a guy and his buddy after one of them flipped out over a game of pool. He was acting pretty crazy and when I started to come out from behind the bar to escort him out, he got angry. I closed the bar down about an hour later. As I was walking out the back door, there he was, about 10 feet from me, and still mad that I had removed him out. And that's the last thing I remember. All the other details came from my girlfriend who had called 911 and saw the whole thing go down. I blacked out when I came to, I had been told that I had been hurt by the guy. I was in a local hospital getting treated and waiting to be transported to another hospital to have my surgeries. Right before I was about to be transported, the police came into the ER and told me they found the guy. He still had the weapon in his pocket and a bunch of prescription medicines in his hotel room. Story 6. I've never told this story here before, but when I was in college, I woke up handcuffed to a hospital bed. The night before, I had a reaction to medication I was taking and started having a medical emergency. My friends were scared and called an ambulance, but I don't like hospitals, so that just made things worse. Eventually, the cops came and tried to help the paramedics get me into the ambulance. They handcuffed me and carried me out, and in that process, I guess I turned my head and hurt one of the cops. I remember none of this and just woke up confused and blind because I didn't have my glasses. I eventually was told that I was under arrest and was going to be taken to the police station after the doctor cleared me. After I got dressed, they cuffed me and put me in the back of a paddy wagon. I was booked into the police station and spent the night there until the next morning when they transferred me to county jail. When I got there, I was terrified, not because of the inmates, but because of the cops. They knew why I was there, and as soon as I got there, they all started staring at me. Spent the next couple of days being shuffled around, unable to make a phone call to my family, and pretty much blind because I didn't have my glasses. When I finally got settled in what was to be my long-term cell, I was told I was being bonded out. That whole experience was strange and scary, but I learned a lot about myself and met a lot of interesting people. I ended up in court for a year and we were able to get the charge down and I had two years of probation. Story 7. I woke up in hospital sheets covering my body and not remembering how I got there. Once they said I got into an accident, I thought I was driving in my SUV and I kept asking if I heard anyone else and who was with me. Once they said I was in my motorcycle, I then noticed I was covered in sheets and kept asking more questions. Then once they confirmed my doubts, I kept trying to figure out how it happened. By that time, my mom and sister were there and kept asking to see my helmet and stuff, trying to figure out how it happened. Kept repeating all the questions many times, forgetting I had asked them. Memories slowly came back within a few days. Didn't lose my memory, just the events of that day. Still to this day, I can't recall the actual accident. I just remember being on the road with people around and me begging them to move me. Then an ambulance arriving and paramedics trying to keep me awake. What had happened was that a car in the middle lane decided to go into the corner gas station crossing the right lane and the turning lane, and I was in the right lane. Yay for helmets. Story 8. 
Woke up to see my mom's face looking down on me along with a few random hospital staff poking around. I think they might have actually been moving me to another room at that point, but it's all fuzzy. It took a while for memories to come back, but I was out drinking and when the bar closed, me and my buddy got some pizza and decided to climb up a rooftop to eat it. We'd been up there many times before, but I was significantly more hammered. After my pizza, I felt sick and didn't want to retch on the rooftop, so I went to climb down. That's my last memory. When I fell, I was knocked out briefly, but by the time my buddy got down to check on me, I was sitting up. He wrapped his shirt around my head and called the cab. I tried to go home, but he told me to go to emergency. He explained all this to me later. I have no recollection of it. I walked in and he helped admit me. He explained what happened and they took me away. They told him they'd hold me overnight and ask if he could come back in the early morning to pick me up and he said yeah. After he left, they did the CAT scan to be sure. They called my parents and they came in. Shortly after, I woke up. I couldn't remember much of anything at first and I was really scared because my mom looked scared. Story 9 I woke up to someone giving me first aid, but I could have easily woken up in a hospital if things had been much worse. My church has a program similar to Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts called Stockade Battalion. We were playing dodgeball, the variant where you go to the back wall of the other team when you get out and catch a ball thrown by your team to get back in. A teammate and I were trying to catch the same ball to get back in, but I ended up catching it first. He and I had an accident and everything went to black. I blacked out in a room full of guys playing dodgeball and came to the same room, empty, except for me and one of the adult leaders presumably applying first aid. I don't know how much time was passed. I don't even know if the room was cleared immediately when I didn't stand up or if I was just left there, undiscovered, until the game was over. I was more disoriented than injured, but if things had been any worse, I sure hope they would have called an ambulance. Story 10 I woke up in a hospital bed with an IV. I managed to get out of bed and looked at my clothes. They were all covered in red liquid. But I wasn't feeling down. I was actually feeling rather good. I was still pissed from the night before. After a while, a nurse came into the room. She didn't speak a word of English. For context, I had just moved to a new country and I didn't speak the local language. So I still had no idea what was going on. At this point, I realized my lip had been treated along with the back of my head. After a while, I was given breakfast and eventually a doctor came into the room. He explained now I was brought in by an ambulance after being harmed. All I knew was I was out drinking with a friend. He then went on to tell me that I fell unconscious while being treated and they had no idea which caused it. Eventually, my friend came to the hospital. He explained how we got jumped at a festival by some other guys and how I went down. Later on, I got in contact with who was my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. We had our third date in the hospital restaurant. I got released the next day, Monday morning, and I have to travel home via the subway in my stained clothes. Well, wearing those stained clothes going back home sure does make everyone know who not to mess with. Story 11. This one is not me, but a close friend, and I think the story is amazing. So, he was locked out of his house, and his landlord was gone for the weekend. So, he decided he would go around back to the alley and climb in a window. So he put a ladder on a dumpster, something he said he knew he shouldn't do as he teaches safety courses. Anyway, due to unforeseen circumstances, he had an accident from the top of the ladder. Now here's where it gets interesting. An anesthesiologist just happened to be driving by and watched his accident. The man had been out to lunch with his daughter who was visiting him and they decided to drive past the house in which she grew up. It happened to be on that street. So the man stops, calls an ambulance, and then calls the hospital to arrange for surgery. He was in surgery in under 30 minutes. So now he's doing fine, staying off ladders for sure. I told him that he was one lucky duck. Story 12. It wasn't a surprise. I was semi-conscious when the ambulance arrived and during the ride, but a funny story nonetheless. I was at a hotel party for a friend's birthday, drank a bit too much, and ended up passing out in a chair in the lobby. Apparently, I was dreaming and talking in my sleep, saying stuff like help me and warn them, etc. So security calls the ambulance, and as they're rolling me out, I halfway realize what's going on. and think to myself that I should wake up and stop them. Tried opening an eye and realized it'd be far easier to just pass back out. The entire ride to the hospital, I was half conscious and again saying stuff like you have to warn them and it's a crisis, everyone in danger. The EMTs tried to press me for details, but I'd always taper off before the big reveal. Later on, after the haze had cleared, I realized what the full warning was that I was trying to say. We're all in danger. There's a crisis coming. You have to warn them. Superman and the Justice League must be warned. Story 13. The first thing I saw was a boy sitting in a chair. 
At first, I thought he was walking past me, but I quickly realized that I was actually being wheeled past him on something. It only lasted for a second, and I thought it might be a dream. Then there was a bright light. I turned my head to the side. That's when I understood that I must have been involved in something, and it probably wasn't that light. My eyes adjusted, and I saw that I was in the emergency room of a hospital. I'd been to a few before in my city, all with long stories behind them. I turned away from the wall and felt everything. As I looked at my body, I noticed a man sitting in a chair on the other side. It was my father. I whispered, not because I was trying to be quiet, but because it hurts to talk. I asked, what happened? He replied with a look I knew well, one of extreme seriousness. It was as if he was saying, you better listen. He said, Victor, be quiet, without looking away from the door. Even more confused, I asked, why? He turned his head towards me and said, if you yell again, they're going to keep you here, and then turned away from me. I thought, what the hell is going on? But I had learned early on not to question that look from my father, so I sat quietly until they said I could leave. When I stood up, I realized my shoes and wallet were missing. Had I been robbed? We left the emergency room. A lot of people looked over at me, but I didn't really care and just walked out calmly, trying not to show any of what I had felt. We went outside and waited for a relative to pick us up. From the hospital, we went to my aunt's house, where I think I had been the day before. When I walked in, my uncle ran up to me, grabbed me by the shoulders, looked at my face, and hugged me tightly. He let go after a couple of minutes and asked if I was okay. I lied and said yes. Over the next half hour or so, my family explained to me that I had been leaving a cousin's house a few streets away and was walking back to my aunt's. This wasn't something I thought I'd do in that area. They said I was with two female cousins and a much younger male cousin when a group of men followed us. All my cousins ran and I was apparently hurt and then I got jumped. I'm pretty athletic and by far the fastest in my family, so I thought I would have run, but then again, I can be arrogant, so maybe I tried to turn to them while trying to protect my cousins. It made sense as far as I could tell, but in the following weeks, things got much stranger. Whenever I'd ask one of the people I was supposedly with, they told me a slightly different version of the story. And then when I asked them again later, their story would change again. First, I was with my cousins, and then I was alone. I stopped asking because either everyone didn't know what happened or more likely they didn't want me to know. About a month later, I found my wallet hidden in their attic, which meant it wasn't stolen by the quote-unquote group of men. I tried really hard to remember for a long time, but I never could. Maybe once a year or so, I asked them what happened and it's always a different story. So why did I wake up in the hospital? I don't really know, but whatever it was, it got me pretty badly. Alright, if you're enjoying the video and any of these are getting to you, then please don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button for more videos just like this. Now on to the next story. Story 14. Happened some years ago. I had been kind of sick with the flu for a few weeks, couldn't seem to shake it. It got a little better, then a bit worse. This was right before Christmas 2012. That year, Christmas Eve and Christmas was on a Monday and Tuesday, so I was just pushing myself to get to that sweet four-day weekend thinking I'd just relax and that get me past it. So I rested all weekend, wasn't eating much, just stayed in the easy chair. The day after Christmas, I still wasn't feeling up for work. I was still at my folks' house for the holidays. So my mom, being a mom, was all, if you're too sick to work, you're going to the doctor. I didn't have insurance at the time, so I hadn't gone. Went to one of those urgent care places instead. I was there for a little while, don't remember much around this point. I remember we left after a while, then woke up in CCU about 12 to 14 days later. Turns out I have the BDs. Now I hear from a lot of people that this is how they find out they're diabetic. Either very low blood sugar, or you go into DKA and get flu or pneumonia. This is where my story takes a house-like turn. Most of the following info I got secondhand after the fact. When leaving the urgent care place, apparently my mother had been told to take me straight to the ER. She got me to the closest one and they took me right in, didn't even wait on the paperwork. They knew right away about the DKA and pneumonia, but something else was wrong. They did MRIs, ran tests, checked for symptoms, and about everything else. Something was still off and they didn't know what it was. I went into respiratory failure that evening and they had to put me in a coma and on life support. They sent the tests to the labs. Now, in-house, they get results back in a few hours and try something else, then run another test and try something else. I'm not sure how accurate that is for most real-life situations. In my case, they had determined there was an abnormal kind of illness or in addition to pneumonia. 
The culture had to grow for 10 days for them to see what was in me to make a solid diagnosis. So the data came back and the doctor working on me spent several days poring over everything she could find to learn what it was. She found a picture in an old textbook of a fungus called rhizopus. Once they figured this out, they were able to find a medicine that could treat it, though it'd be a 13-week course of treatments. So they pulled me off the sedation after 10 days and it took me a few days to wake up. Apparently, they told my folks to start planning my funeral, so that's creepy. When I woke up, they started the treatments the next day. I wasn't out of the woods yet, though. After I woke up, the pulmonary doctor did a bronchoscopy. She said they looked like they were full of pink fluffy-like cotton candy or pink marshmallow fluff. That was on a Wednesday, January 9th, 2013. She did another scope that Friday and said it looked less inflamed, so that was great news, and she said that she'd do another one on Monday. So the weekend passes, she comes back and runs another. This time, when she put the tube in, apparently a sweet odor was released immediately. She said, do you smell that? Something smells sweet. My right lung looked even better. My left lung, well, she said, looked black and green and spiky. So that's a bad thing, I guess. This is a part I remember for myself really clearly. I woke up from that procedure and the nurse told me to wait a moment and left the room. She came back with a pulmonary doctor, a surgeon, and my mom and dad. Oh gee, mom and dad have been crying but are smiling through it. That's not a good sign. The surgeon explained what they found and said we pretty much have two choices. We can do surgery and you have about a 50-50% chance of surviving. Or we can keep you on the medication and do everything else we can for you. Now, even being half asleep, I knew that meant praying for a miracle and making me comfortable. Now, I'm a Christian. I have faith in miracles and such, but I also believe one of the greatest things we have as a species is a brilliant and curious mind that has led to such things as music, art, bacon, and medicine. So I'd be a fool, in my opinion, to ignore the advice and help of the fine doctors and nurses in front of me. And to be honest, I remember thinking to myself at that moment, hmm, I've never had a major surgery. It'll be interesting if I come through. So I wrote surgery on the little marker board I had since I couldn't speak. I had surgery the next morning. Afterwards, I remained in CCU for a total of 76 days, 99 days total in the hospital. I still had to run the full 13-week course of that medicine. I had a lot of rehabilitation and therapy for months after, a lot of it dealing with the extensive muscle atrophy pretty much everywhere. Three years later, I've much improved. I lost a bit of mobility. My stamina isn't what it was, obviously. But I got a good job, got a girl, and overall, things are actually a lot better than it was before. Nothing like almost passing away to spice up your life, you know? Story 15. About six months before this event, I had started working out. On a particularly hot day, I exercised by taking a dance class followed by some weight training. I drank a lot of water, thinking I needed to stay hydrated. I consumed over 40 ounces during the hour-long high-cardio dance class and then drank even more while lifting weights. I started feeling a bit lightheaded, but since it wasn't unusual, I didn't pay much attention to it. As a tip, having clear whiz, which I thought meant I was well hydrated, is not a good goal for your body's metabolism. When it was time to pick up my daughter from preschool, I left the gym. As I walked in to get her, I felt extremely lightheaded. I held onto the door for a few extra seconds until I felt okay. I picked her up and we headed home. The lightheadedness became worse as we drove. I couldn't shake it off and it felt worse than driving while being buzzed. I was afraid I might do something, so I pulled into a McDonald's parking lot to catch my breath and clear my head enough to make it the rest of the way home. I also wanted to reassure my daughter, who was four years old and worried. That's the last thing I remember clearly. There are some strange, fleeting images in my memory, but they didn't make sense until my husband explained what happened afterward. I woke up in the hospital three days later. I had meningitis caused by over-drinking of water. I had diluted myself so much that I had almost no electrolytes left to the point where I was completely disassociated. Apparently, I did make it home, although I have no memory of driving there. Neighbors saw me rushing around my front yard strangely and muttering to myself. A large Amazon package had arrived and thankfully my little girl had opened it and was playing safely with the packaging peanuts on our front porch. The neighbors called my husband and the EMTs. My husband said that the EMTs thought I was on something and they had to catch me to treat it, which is where some of those weird memory images come from. I spent three days completely out of it. I had vague memories of the event. Then I woke up clear-headed except for the worst headache. I spent another two days at the hospital getting back into shape and waiting for things like my ability to find words to return. 
To this day, 10 days later, I still struggle with some words, including, strangely enough, meningitis and encephalitis. I still work out intensely, but in the 10 years since, I have avoided drinking straight water for hydration. I always make sure whatever I drink has plenty of electrolytes, and I never consume more than 30 ounces per workout. There were about a half a dozen points during this event when my daughter and I could have been in an accident, not from being medically critical in the hospital, but from things like driving while dissociated, running around my yard like a crazy person, possibly into the street and in front of a car, resisting treatment, and the fact that they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me until the second day. I'm an atheist, but it feels almost like something or someone was looking out for my little one and me. It's a strange feeling. Story 16. I have Crohn's disease, and there was a time when I thought I was just sick, having a flare-up of the disease. I didn't want to go to the hospital because I don't like hospitals and hoped I would get better on my own. However, I got sicker and sicker until I passed out and couldn't walk. I could talk, but I had trouble thinking clearly and kept passing in and out of consciousness. During this time, I went to see my GI doctor to find out if I was really sick or just having a flare-up. Unfortunately, he didn't catch what was happening and didn't order any imaging tests. He just gave me an extra anti-inflammatory pill, told me not to worry, and sent me back home. I ended up waking up in the hospital where I was being treated for severe sepsis from perforated bowels. I survived and wasn't completely messed up because my body managed to wall off the perforations with abscess walls. Because I underestimated how sick I was and waited too long to get to the hospital, my heart rate was over 200 when I arrived at the ER, constantly over 185, and my BP was very low. The doctors were able to treat the severe sepsis quickly, but they told me I would be in the hospital for the next three to four months. It ended up just being three weeks because I didn't need to stay for the whole thing once I was stable enough to go home. During those three weeks, I barely slept, maybe two or three nights, even if that. I was very sick for about a year after that until I was finally sent to the Cleveland Clinic for surgery. I was treated by one of the best surgeons in the world who has been at the top of his profession for many years. He was recommended to my mom by a doctor she worked with. He and his team saved me and I was lucky that my body responded the way it did and that I lived. I didn't even need an ostomy. Everyone was surprised that I wasn't sicker than I ended up being since I avoided the ICU and was just very sick instead of critically ill. It wasn't an easy year or two, but hopefully it won't happen again because the surgery managed to treat me. So, for anyone who knows someone with Crohn's disease, it can be more serious than it looks to someone on the outside. Story 17. This isn't quite waking up in the hospital, but rather the exact opposite. Just a little background about me. I'm a teenager who spends pretty much all his time on the computer, gaming and such. I'll refer to myself as a Tarmon. Two weeks ago, I was sitting in my living room playing video games. It was late and both my parents were asleep. I finished up at around 1 and was starting to go to bed. When I was walking up to my room, I somehow missed a step and fell backwards about three steps back to the ground. I knew immediately something was wrong. It was a carpeted floor, so I didn't hear that much of a thud. I tried to stand up, but it felt like my body had just shut down. I tried to scream, but all I could manage was a little whimper. It must have been about five minutes, but my dad finally heard me and came downstairs. He helped me up and got me into the car, saying we needed to go to the hospital. I've never dealt with a medical emergency before, and my dad, with the same lifestyle as me, hadn't either. All we both knew was that you shouldn't fall asleep for the first few hours. As we were pulling out of my driveway, he told me to stay on my phone to stay awake. I checked to see who was online, and I saw my girlfriend. We'll call her Isabella. We started talking. I told her what was happening. She asked a bunch of stuff. Are you okay? And stuff like that. All this time, my dad is still just driving me to the hospital. Every once in a while, I look out the window. Through the darkness, I can see the houses and stuff as we drive past. But for some reason, it looks like we keep driving past the same few buildings. I don't really mind it and keep talking to my Isabella. We had one of the most heartfelt conversations I've ever had in my life. I even told her I love you for the first time in the year or so we've been dating. At one point, she told me I should listen to some music to stay awake. When I asked my dad to turn on the radio, he said nothing and just didn't acknowledge me at all. Thought it was weird, but I didn't think too much about it. After about two hours of me and her talking, she stayed up until 3 a.m. for me. She's the best. She asks me if I'm at the hospital yet. For the first time, I thought about why we hadn't arrived yet. The nearest hospital to my house is about 15 minutes away, and we'd been on the road for just under two hours. Right then, I see the car turn into the hospital parking lot, and I'm helped out of the car. I get inside, and my dad checks me in. We go to a room, and I sit down in a chair. 
I remember just sitting there, looking down, staring at my phone, telling Isabella I was there. I hear a man's voice, and I assume it was a doctor. He said, What are you doing? Can you look at me? Tarman, what happened? Suddenly, I shook myself out of whatever trance I was in, and there I was. My dad was standing over me, trying to see what I had done to myself and if I was still breathing. I had hallucinated the whole two hour car ride. My first reaction was that I had just been out and dreaming until I looked down at my phone and Isabella was asking if I had seen the doctor yet. I know I wasn't asleep for all this time because I still have all the messages between me and my girlfriend during those two hours. I still have no clue how I managed to hallucinate so vividly about everything that was going on around me. Isabella assumes I lied about the whole thing and was saying how mad she was that I kept her up. Honestly, I don't expect any of you to believe me either, but I know what I saw or didn't see, I guess. Story 18. I was sitting in my high school English class reading and the next thing I knew, I woke up in an ambulance. I was put down and I looked to my left. One of the ambulance guys was sitting with me. He said, you had a seizure. And I just said, that makes sense and slid an arm out of the straps to reach for my phone. The phone was still in my pocket. I had so many text messages and no idea what had really happened. The recollection I have is that I was reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, ironically a book with lots of seizures in it, and my jaw started twitching. This had been happening occasionally during lengthy reading sessions. Normally I would stop reading, but I was at the end of the book, so I pressed on. Then this next part I thought was a dream, but turned out to be real. My jaw locked open and every other sound faded into the background, kind of like when in a movie someone hears a loud noise right next to them and the audio all sounds distant and echoey. I made the loudest, most obscure sound I'd ever heard come out of me. Then I woke up in the ambulance. I thought that was a dream, but I guess that was the start of the seizure. My classmates said I got up at my desk and made that crazy noise and that they tried to get me down. They then said I was taken to the school nurse and told them my name but the wrong birth date. Apparently I thought I was 22. I was 18 at the time. The most ironic part is that the English teacher was completely seizure prepared. He had a seizure blanket and knew exactly what to do because he'd had a student before that had multiple seizures. However, he was gone that day so I completely scared the substitute teacher. The irony of reading a book with seizure themes right before experiencing one yourself is pretty striking. Story 19 I went skiing in high school. I was super excited because I was going to be with friends from another school. Unfortunately, the last thing I remember was getting on the bus. I woke up in the hospital and the first thing I noticed was that there was something in me, a catheter. So obviously, I immediately screamed out, What is it? The mortified nurse removed it before I yanked it out by myself and told me to calm down. Then I asked why I was there. Apparently, while I was skiing, I went down a run in a new area that had never been on before and did not wear a helmet. I proceeded to fail the run, as my friends later told me. One minute, I was in front of them. The next minute, I had fallen down. Obviously, they laughed at me until they looked back and realized that I wasn't getting up or even moving. I was taken by ski patrol to the ambulance, which brought me to the local hospital. I was supposed to be airlifted to the Mayo Clinic, one of the best hospitals in the world, as my primary caregiver. However, the weather was not safe to fly in, so I was driven from the hospital to Mayo in an ambulance. I only mention this because you would be amazed how much a 50-minute ambulance ride will cost. Turns out I had gotten a serious injury as a result of my fall. When I was conscious, I don't remember any of this though, I was talking a bunch of gibberish and kept repeating myself over and over again. At this point, it was too early to know what would happen, but my mother, who works as a physical therapist who deals with head trauma patients, was worried that I would have severe lasting consequences or potentially never be a functioning adult. Luckily, I made a full recovery. I still have issues with my memory, specifically focusing on more than one thing at a time and forgetting things frequently. Moral of the story is, always wear your helmet. Story 20. I was having a pretty normal morning until I drank an energy drink. My heart started beating weirdly and I told my girlfriend so. It was really unnatural, like beating fast for three seconds, then not beating at all. Didn't know what to do, so we went to the emergency room. I don't remember anything beyond being admitted. I woke up in the CCU, couldn't speak, couldn't remember who I was, couldn't move beyond very heavy hand movements at best. I had been in a comatose state for two weeks. My girlfriend was there the whole time. I don't remember a lot until I woke up one morning and I could think. I looked at the wall that had my whiteboard with my daily routine on it and I could read it. My nurse came in and scared me, but I was awake. I didn't remember the past two weeks, but I was there again. After almost three years, I still haven't recovered. I found out I had a genetic cancer called MEN2A on top of regular thyroid cancer. 
My thyroid is gone, along with most of my lymph nodes in my neck. The cancer grew a tumor the size of a grapefruit on my right adrenal gland, and they removed both of them. I'm forever grateful to my girlfriend, who I'm still with, who saw it wasn't just me feeling weird, the doctors who worked all day and night to save me, and everyone at the hospital I was in. Story 21. It was the winter of 2000. I was home from college for winter break, and I had been playing a lot of Half-Life 1. I hadn't been eating well, sleeping much, and had been stressing out a lot because, yeah, again, Half-Life 1. So I invited my friend over to hang out and see the game. He stepped away to use the bathroom, and I thought it'd be a great idea to use a cheat code. I did it at the very beginning of the game where the character is supposed to be getting teleported all over. It didn't happen. The screen started to flash green and black really quickly, and I remember thinking it was really cool. I remember briefly waking up in the cold as something went into my arm but didn't really wake up until I was in a hospital bed. My father leaned over me and told me what happened. My friend had come back from the bathroom and found me seizing. He went down to my parents and told them. They had heard a thump from upstairs where my bedroom was but didn't think much of it. My parents didn't believe him at first but came up anyway. My father, seeing a grin on my face, thought I was kidding and tried to wake me up after I didn't respond. He had my mom call EMS right then and there. Alright, if any of these stories got to you, here's more for you. YouTube thinks you're going to love this. I'll catch you in that video and thanks for hanging with me on this one.